today marks our entry into a most dangerous season. We speak of this as the passion journey, Jesus' journey to the cross, and we're trying to rush ourselves past brutality and the horror so we can once again rejoice on Resurrection Sunday with feasting and early breakfasts and brunch and celebrations with family and Easter hams. When I say that we are entering a most dangerous season, I'm not, I'm not talking about gutting out these last few days of doing without our favorite chocolate and soda. I'm not talking about trying to debate whether or not we need to add Easter purchases of new clothes to our already overspent credit card. No, this is the most dangerous season. This one is one in which we know the stories, or we think we do. We can recite them from heart, or we think we can, but can we? It's the most dangerous seasons because if we really pay attention to the stories, the cost of discipleship may be more than 40 days without your favorite food or beverage. The cost of discipleship may require that we not be lulled to sleep by Good Friday sermons that declare our wretchedness or sound like a movie review for Mel Gibson's film, The Passion of Christ. Do I sound harsh? Perhaps. But this most dangerous season provides a seductive temptation to go with what we know or to go with what we think we know. And this morning, I invite you to hear again with me this old, old story. I invite us to struggle together to make 21st century connections to this old, old story so that we can, we can more faithfully and fully work and witness to this world that God loves so much. First of all, the story that we read was not written down in real time. Lester Holt wasn't standing there with his mic, standing at the edge of the crowd, his film crew interviewing participants. He wasn't, they weren't panning the crowd and providing narrative and observations. This was recorded some 70 years or so after the event and was written to a community that is not so different from our own. My dear friend and colleague, Dr. Anna Case Winter, writes in her commentary of Matthew, she describes the context in which this is written. There was conflict and division in the community of faith. Some were insiders, some were outsiders. Political and religious leaders were co-opted, mistrusted, and discredited. The great majority of common people were without power, and there was a clashing of cultures. Hmm. Does that resonate at all with our own context? The gospel could very well have been written to our current events, our news headlines. It's in this type of contest that Jesus ministers and teaches and heals and prepares his disciples. It is in this context that we, 21st century disciples, are called to serve and witness. So let's begin our journey to Jerusalem. In, in chapter 16 of Matthew, Jesus begins foretelling his death and telling his disciples that he's headed toward Jerusalem. And you may remember the story where Peter says, no way, Lord, and Jesus rebukes him. And then we've heard earlier this season, he takes Peter, James, and John to a mountain where he was transfigured and God's voice booms from the heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then he cures a boy with demons, he foretells his own death again, he teaches a bunch of parables, he addresses difficult concepts like divorce, he blesses the little children, he watches the rich young man turn his back on the kingdom. He tells some more parables. He foretells his death yet again and resurrection. And he feels a request from the mother of James and John who asks that her son be given seats of honor, having no idea 
what she's asking for. His final recorded act before entering Jerusalem, as we read in chapter 1, 21, is healing two blind men. Jesus has been busy, busy, busy over these days of travel. And so we finally find ourselves in Jerusalem where Jesus sends off a couple of his guys to get a donkey, which fulfills the prophecy spoken by Zechariah. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples do as he says. They bring the donkey, put their coats on them. A huge crowd has gathered, and they put their cloaks on the road as well as palm branches. And Jesus enters the city to a city that shouts and cries, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The whole city is in a turmoil. The word is translated earthquake. It's a seismic shift happening, a turmoil. Folks who didn't know what was going on were asking, who is this guy? What is up with him? And those in the know responded, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. When Jesus enters Jerusalem, a conspiracy between the religious leaders was already in the works. It's been smoldering for a while now. The Jewish leaders are trying to preserve faith and traditions as well as navigate the relationships with the Roman Empire's ruling elite. And Jesus' appeal to the masses and his ongoing critique of the religious leaders was just adding fuel to the fire. For all practical purposes, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was a dead man walking, or in this case, a dead man riding a donkey. But let's look a little closer. First, the crowd threw down their cloaks. Now, this happens a couple of times in the Bible. For example, in 2 Kings 9, they put cloaks under the king's feet, and it declares their loyalty. You would only throw down your cloak to celebrate and show how highly you value this person. It implies that if necessary, you would give anything that you have. And remember, in all likelihood, you're not going to be wearing that cloak again. So if that's your only cloak, you need to be sure about your allegiances. If you back the wrong guy, not just you, but your whole family is in danger. You'll be out in the cold, literally. Conquerors tend to hold grudges against those whose allegiance lies elsewhere. But not only did they throw down their cloaks, but they also waved their palm branches. And this has royal overtones as well. About 200 years before Jesus entered Jerusalem, Judas Maccabeus conquered the pagan armies that had oppressed the Israelites, and this was how he was welcomed in Jerusalem, as a conquering king and liberator. They had a historical memory of liberation, and they were so sure that Jesus was going to follow suit. And finally, you add the Hosanna to the son of David, and you have sent a message that leaves absolutely no chance of misunderstanding. This is the city of David, his capital. And remember that part about the kingdom not having an end? And these are the people who have been waiting and praying year after year after oppressive year for a king like David a liberator who would lift the yoke of bondage and oppression, release them from Roman occupation. These were a desperate people engaged in a last-ditch effort to herald in a new kingdom with promise, promises for a future that they can barely imagine. And for a few brief moments, they had hope. And yet Jesus did not enter as a king. He rode on a donkey, not a warrior's steed. There was no parade of force with warriors on their fancy horses preparing the way for the king. 
There was no real entourage except of his scruffy disciples who didn't really understand what was going on. And even more telling, there were no dignitaries on hand to welcome him. No sycophants or minions looking for ways that they could benefit from him. No jesters or jugglers for entertainment. So while the crowd acted like Jesus was a victorious king, Jesus presented himself quite differently. He entered humbly, with authority, yes, but with humility and no pretenses and no promises for political and or social religious relief. There is a gap, a mismatch between the expectations and the desires of the crowd and what Jesus understands his mission to be. When this, the crowd is shouting, son of David, they are, uh, they are indicating allegiance to a king, a king who is going to bring justice and restoration to a people beat down and burdened by Roman occupation and religious oppressions. Be the king that we want you to be and liberate us. We're not so different from that crowd. And our context is not so different from Matthew's community. There are conflicts and divisions in the community of faith, whether it's a church fight, a denominational split, or disrespecting persons like Dr. Gina Stewart disrespected by the head of the Convention of National Baptists. Oh, we have plenty of conflicts and divisions, and we find that generosity of heart and patience are often in short supply. Our political and religious leaders are often co-opted and discredited, which breeds distrust and the refrain, well, my vote doesn't make a difference. Our moral outrage has turned to numbness at the sheer magnitude of disappointment after disappointment in our leaders. There are insiders and outsiders in our communities, and if you're an outsider, you can bet you have no power. Ask our new neighbors and immigrants how they feel when they are, walk out the door and are met with hostility. And clashing cultures, critical race theory, book banding, targeting LGBTQI persons, disbanding of DEI programs, and we are still haunted by the aftermath of January 6th as we enter an electoral season that is promising to go way beyond ugly. These common experiences are just the tip of the iceberg. Add that to the mix, add our own personal sorrows and fears, add our own anxieties and exhaustion, and we have a potent cocktail for despair. And what do despairing people want? We want Jesus to ride into our city and be the king we want him to be, to be the savior that we want him to be. We want Jesus to ride into our city and fix the wrongs, to heal our sick, to pay our bills, to provide certainty. On the words of that old spiritual, oh, fix me. Oh, fix me, fix me, Jesus, fix me for my long white robe, for my starry crown, for my journey home, for my dying bed. Fix me, Jesus. Fix me. But that's not quite how Jesus works. And if we're truthful, we may be or are angry and disappointed that we feel like we've been sold a bill of goods and maybe all of this, and then we feel guilty for being a lousy Christian, because hasn't Jesus saved us from hell? But what if Jesus' entry into our city and into our lives is an invitation for something more than a fix me Jesus? What if God's power is not that of a puppet master pulling the strings, a genie who gives us three wishes? What if God's presence and power in our life is just that? It's an invitation into the work of transformation, invitation into transformation 
for our communities, our families, transformation of ourselves in partnership with God. What if God is not a fix-it God? What if God is not the God that we want God to be? What if God is more? Wants us more? Believes in us more? What if God does not want to do for us, but what God wants to do is with us? God with us. That's what Emmanuel is. God with us. God with us. If we believe that God is with us in our sorrows, in our brokenness of our communities, in our conflicts, in our isolations, in our clashes, in all that is life for us, then perhaps the plea is no longer, fix me, Jesus, some kind of external intervention perhaps then the plea becomes, help me to be more fully with you, Jesus. No longer be the God I want you to be, rather help me to be the disciple, the learner, the witness, the worker, until all of us come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. I invite you to take a few moments of silence to attend to what might be stirring in your souls, questions or disagreements or fears or encouragements, to think about where you long for God's presence, for how God is personally calling you to be more fully in partnership, for how God might be calling Hyde Park Union to be more fully with God, to think about whether or not you're ready to relinquish your fix me Jesus for the God who wants to be with you.